Hello, everybody. All right, terrific. Well, welcome to Firaxicon. Uh, I'm Steve Martin. I'm the studio head and president of Firaxis Game, and it's my pleasure to get the opportunity to welcome you all and have this event hosted for you. When it comes to you guys, truly, on behalf of our employees that are here and the employees that aren't here, you are our lifeline to giving you the games that you want and continuing to give them because we know what you want. So we thank you for that. We thank you for being here tonight to share in all of this. With no further ado, though, I know the big event for you is coming, and it is my privilege to be able to introduce to you an evening with two of our creative designers, two of our creative directors, uh, Jake Solomon and Sid Meyer. Seriously? Is that? Oh, okay. Thank you, Steve. Is this, is this on? All right, is this thing on? Hey. Uh, hey there, how y'all doing? All right. Okay. <clears throat> yes, tonight what I'm going to do is talk to uh, the man, the legend, uh, Sid. We're going to first talk about, you haven't seen these questions before, have you? That's a lie. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about sort of Sid's history. Sid's long, long, very long oh, history. Oh. Um, gets longer every year, um, which is a good thing. It beats the alternative, right? Um, and, then, and then we're going to talk a little bit about being designers, being um, um, game developers. So are you ready, Sin? I'm ready. Yeah, look at all these questions I have here. So <laughs> let's start at the very beginning. Um, so how did your parents meet? <laughs> oh, no, no, not that, not that early. Um, so are there games from your childhood that stuck out to you? So this is pre-video games. So are these schoolyard games, board games, card games? What were the first games that made an impression on you? I was definitely into games when I was young. Um, I remember covering the living room floor with toy soldiers and bricks and whatever it was. And then uh, <clears throat> as I got a little older, kind of getting into uh, Avalon Hill games, kind of strategy games, etc. This was, of course, before there were computer games. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I think that it was almost a natural evolution for me to kind of uh, get into the industry when it was uh, just starting out. But it was... Uh, I studied computers in college, and I was I loved games. And when computer gaming became an actual possibility, I jumped right on it. You were the perfect guy. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of the games that that we know and love you for, and we do know and love you, Sid. Um, they I'm all are sure. sort of focused around these these childhood subjects of wonder, the things we loved as kids. So planes and trains and dinosaurs and and history and so. Is that something you went back to once you started developing games like this, or is this something that you've always been interested in? Well, I think most game designers design games for themselves, so it's going to be a topic that I think is interesting and fun. And, you know, you point that out. I realized after I did a couple of games, these are all things that I was really fascinated with when I was a kid. Um, and as a, so I kind of had a, an understanding of what was cool about these things, and I wanted to bring those things to life in a in a game, so, uh, and as an adult, though, I could kind of add that strategy, that depth, those other kind of things. So um, it's really reliving my, my youth in a lot of ways, the, the fantasy of pirates or, or, or trains or um, <clears throat> airplanes, things like that, but kind of combining the, the fun of, of uh, what, you know, the way a kid approaches a topic and exploring it. There's, a, there's kind of, a, uh, I think, a, a uncovering and exploration in a game, which was uh, the same thing I experienced when I was a kid, when I would, I'd get interested in trains and I'd trying to find every book I could and explore, and, and finding out all these cool things about it was really fun. And I think uh, games allow you to do that as well. That's why we have you know, the Civilopedia, the Trainopedia, whatever the Opedia is, to kind of allow you to, uh, to learn a little bit more as you're, as you're playing. Yes, and so to paraphrase that, game designers are just grown-up children, basically. Not even grown-up so much. Right, right yeah, yeah, basically just children, so. <laughs> frustrated children. The frustrated children. <laughs> So, wow, this got dark real quick. Okay. Uh, supposed to be positive. Um, all right, so now here, here's the thing. There are a lot of things about you that a lot of people don't know. You're sort of a man uh, of mystery. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recount some strange facts about you, and you're going to explain them to me. You were born in Canada. Yes. Yes, Canada. Canada. Yeah, mm. uh, you have dual citizenship. 
correct? W with with uh, Sweden, Switzerland. 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 <laughs> same. It's not the Jake, same country. Does, Jake believes that Switzerland and Sweden are the same country. They are, he, he they are very <laughs> similar <laughs> sounding. The two letters are very first. Yes. Okay. Let's move on. So, um, so you basically what I'm asking is, are you a spy? Um, <laughs> how long have you been a spy? I know. So. How do you go from being born in Canada, having dual citizenship somewhere along the way, and then you end up in Baltimore making games? Well, my parents were both immigrants from Europe. My mother from Holland, my father from Switzerland. Uh, that's how I ended up being born in Canada, because they actually couldn't get into the US right away. You had to have $5,000 before you could get into the US. They had to kind of collect that. Um, <clears throat> but I actually, uh, they moved to Detroit Michigan, where I grew up when I was about three or four years old. So I actually grew up in Michigan. The Swiss will never take your citizenship away, so I still have a Swiss citizenship. That kind of explains uh, all that. But, um, you know. This I, is a great <laughs> cover story for you being a spy. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, I'm just not buying it, though, so. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> the fact that there might be a few lines of code, you know, <laughs> telemetry that does come back. But. So. You, you talked about this earlier. You are, you're a Michigan man, as they say. So you went to Michigan for college, and that's because you grew up there in Michigan, and your degree is in computers. Sweden, Switzerland, <laughs> Sweden, Switzerland. No. Um, it's in computer science. Computer science. Computers. Okay. Computers Same in those me. days, of course, were huge things that you worshipped right. in a large uh, air-conditioned room and fed with punch cards and hoped hours later something might come back. Right, it was so a, a slightly different time. A little bit. So yeah. why why computers? That I mean, that was just becoming a burgeoning field at that point. So what like what drew you to computers? Computers. Uh, well, I was I went into college uh, for physics and math, uh, but computers were so empowering. You know, the idea that you could uh, write a program that would calculate pi to ten thousand digits or would just do cool things with just a few instructions was was exciting to me. And I actually got a job with a professor doing some programming, and I, he paid me, and uh, I got to work on an actual terminal, and it was just kind of a, a, a brand new field. I think, you know, I think game designers like to do new things. Would you agree with me, Jake? Uh, kind of explore. I, I guess so. I, I remade XCOM, but yeah, sure, yeah, yeah we you, like to you do. You made it even better, things. though. Brand new things, brand new. <laughs> so we like to explore new frontiers, and that, that was really the new frontier at that time. Okay, we're so artists. Our, Jake, we are artists. You know, we, we, are, we are breaking yeah. new ground. We're, oh, yeah. We're, I, I agree. I agree with you. <clears throat> You're an artist. Um, the, <laughs> so, okay, this, this leads to one of my favorite stories that you've told me before. But, so what was your first job after college? Do you know where I'm leading with this? Probably. Maybe. Okay, so Maybe. what was your first job after college? Uh, I worked um, for a company headquartered in, in Maryland, uh, installing cash register systems in the Detroit area. Oh, say um, the word. What is the name oh, of the machine oh, oh, yes, the, you worked on? And uh, we had the mighty totalizator. <laughs> the totalizator, <laughs> which is the We're, fakest <laughs> name I've ever heard. It's, it was like an accounting machine or something, it and they a, called it, it the totalizator. The totalizator. It was it's not even English. <laughs> But it's awesome. I, th I think it would be an awesome boss in one of our games. It, yeah. Um, you know what that sounds like? Spy hardware. <laughs> the totalizator. That sounds like something you'd plant in Eastern Europe and, you know, all hail the right, totalizator. Right. Collects mega, megabytes of data and yeah. processes it. It actually uh, was used at racetracks to calculate the odds for, for races. Totalized all the, uh, the, really? all the odds and spit out the odds. Yeah. So, it all right. Totally on the up and up. And so you have not, yeah, I bet, you have not been back to, uh, you know, casino gaming yet, but that could be, you could make a grand return, make a game Sid Meier's Totalizator, you know? <laughs> just, just. Let me write that down. Just think about it. <laughs> just consider it, okay? I get half. Um, so, and then, after that, there's this gap in, in my knowledge, but you form Microprose with Bill Staley, and everybody called him Wild Bill, and I, hopefully you'll explain why that is. But you and Bill founded Microprose, which is one of the absolutely iconic game studios. Um, absolutely. I mean, that, 
that was, you know, that was the heart of sort of the golden era of games. And so how did you go from, you know, doing espionage in Eastern Europe with the totalizator to then, like, founding a game studio, one of the game studios that became, you know, one of the great well, studios of all time? Well, I could see the Cold War coming to an end. <laughs> and uh, really, my spying skills really wouldn't have any use anymore. So uh, I was... I was actually at a meeting in Las Vegas, uh, and I ran into Bill Staley. And we both worked for the same company, but we'd never met. Uh, but we got to conversing, and he asked me, you know, what was, you know, what was I into? And I said, well, I'm, I'm fiddling with these computer games. And he said, well, well I'm a hotshot fighter pilot, and I'd like to sell those computer games, doggone it, because this is the... This is the future. And this is how this happens? This is how the, the greatest so, game studios ever created. Okay. So we wandered, this is, this, we wandered around Las Vegas, and we found this Red Baron game in the, in the basement of the MGM Grand ca uh, Casino. And Bill sits down you know, <clears throat> and, uh, to the game, and he's, you know, I'm a fighter pilot. I'll show you how this is done, young man. And so he you know, scores like 3,000 points. So I sat down, and I got like 6,000 points. And he said, well, you know, how do you do that? I'm a fighter pilot. You're just a nerd. You know, how could you beat me at this game? I said, well, you know, I was watching you play. I kind of figured out the algorithm, what was going on there. And he said, oh, you're pretty smart. We should start a company. And uh, <laughs> so we did. Oh, so that's why nobody's offered to start a company with me. <laughs> so... So now, so he was a fighter pilot, and, and, and they called him Wild Bill. Did he call himself Wild Bill? Who called him Wild Bill, or is this, is this apocryphal? He called himself Wild Bill. Oh, you can't give yourself a nickname? <laughs> Apparently you can if okay. you're a fighter pilot. <laughs> so, and he wore flight suits to the he, office? He wore is, flight suits okay. to the office. We had to stand and salute, and, uh, <laughs> and he had his own airplane. We had to... If we were bad, we had to fly with him in it. So. Yeah. You think he's yes. joking. He's not, yeah. <laughs> yes. All it right, so you and, you and Wild Bill, now, how did that work in the beginning? Like, how did you found the company? How did you get games selling? I mean, there weren't publishers then, right? We were actually almost a perfect combination because I had no interest in doing what he wanted to do, and he had no interest in doing what I wanted to do. So I wanted to make games and be creative. He wanted to go out there and sell um, so it was really a wonderful uh, collaboration. He did all the, the marketing and sales, and he had all the energy for that. And I was interested in making games, and so the two of us kind of uh, covered half the territory, but never really got in each other's way. And it was a, it was a wonderful, you know, those, those, those days were uh, very exciting. We were just inventing the industry. You know, people ask me, how do you become a game designer? I say, well, you just sit down and type in a game into your computer, and you're a game designer. That's really the way it was back then. I did all the art, the sound, the programming, printed the manuals on my printer and put them in a baggie and yeah. sent Bill on his way to sell them. So Ten miles uphill <laughs> both ways to Microprose. It was a slightly That's different, right. yes, yes. So... And we did games in about two months in, back in those days. Two, two months? Two months. Really? Maybe, maybe three if it was, like, you know, in-depth. Like, how much staff did you have? Me, Were there, me. It was you. Yeah, it was yeah. you and, and Bill. Okay. Yeah. All right. Did you have an office to start? No, I worked at home. I didn't actually didn't really quit my day job for a long time because I didn't think this was going to go very far. Yeah, so I, so I smart guy, huh? Those video day. games will never pan out. <laughs> so I worked out of my home for a long time. So then, in those days, how did you decide what to do? Like, obviously, nobody's. I mean, did did Bill Wild Bill? Did he <laughs> tell you what to do, did, or did you just say, you know what, this is the game I want to make next? It was basically, um, I feel like making, I mean, my first game was um, Pac-Man ripoff. Um, oh, what I, was the name? Um, Pac-Man ripoff? I, I forget. <laughs> it's a little on the nose, <laughs> Sid, you know. Pick-Man, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I did a helicopter, 2D scrolling helicopter game, and then I finally did a Airplane flying game, and that's when Bill got excited and decided we were going to go somewhere. So uh, it was really the technology in those days, in a lot of ways, that, that limited what we could do. And when we kind of discovered some new technology trick, we, we built a game around it. So for, uh, for Hellcat Ace, which was the first flight simulator, figure out a way to make the horizon tilt left and right. Doesn't sound that exciting these days, but in those days it was, uh, it was a big deal. And so we made a game about that. And when we discovered 3D, we said, hey, we'll make 3D games. So, a lot of technology kind of figuring out before we could move, move the state of the art forward. 
And then what was, I mean, do you distinctly remember a moment where you thought to yourself, well, I'm going to be okay making games. Like, this is kind of a big deal. Was it uh, some sort of sales figures or you meet with fans? Or what was it that sort of made you think, if you can remember a moment where you said, you know, this is going to be pretty big? We, uh, I made a game called Solo Flight, which was a civilian flight simulator, and uh, that got picked up by a couple of distributors. Up to then, Bill was kind of on the road with his trunk full of baggies trying to sell our games. So when we got a little bit of distribution, it kind of felt like we might be on our way, and that was kind of the moment, probably when I quit my day job and did this full time, and it, it, it just felt like we were moving forward. And then uh, we did games like Silent Service and uh, the original, <laughs> um, where people were actually anticipating the games and kind of, you know, we, we would sell a, a, a reasonable number to allow us to, uh, to build another game, and we could hire an artist then. That was a milestone. We, had, we had an artist on silent service. Wow. So, Must have you know. blown everybody's <laughs> minds. <laughs> Yes, it, yes. It were, did, were, you, were you a little bit, like, sad to give up? The, it was hard uh, to give up, you know. I thought I was a pretty good artist, but then I saw what this guy could do, and it was like, oh, okay. I guess I'm not an artist. <laughs> 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 so how long was it from when you met Bill to when Solo Flight? When you said, you know, I'm going to do this full time? It's probably about a year and a half, I'd say. Like oh, I'd wow. say, it was probably our fifth or sixth game, but we were just cranking them out one, on, one after the other. So uh, You worked late nights at home? I mean, were you just, like... Burning the midnight. But we, only, we had like 24k, and then eventually 48k to fill. So right. you know, when the, when we filled up the memory, we were done. So we, <laughs> shipped it, we shipped it. That's a hell of a way to make a game. <laughs> That's kind of how we do it now. Actually, it's not that different. So you look at the games that you made, and in general, it's in the beginning: flight simulator, flight simulator, flight simulator, flight simulator, flight simulator, flight simulator, flight simulator with missiles, flight simulator. <laughs> And then, out of nowhere, 1987, then you make Pirates. Just, I mean, it stands out stark, right? Uh. <laughs> so you're making these first-person flight simulators, and then all of a sudden you make, oh, I'm going to do an open-world uh, pirating Adventure RPG. Game. Like, where did, that, where did that come from? Well, uh, we had finished F-15, and that kind of it had chaff and flares and 3D and all the cool stuff I thought we could do. Um, and I was kind of, you know, figured I had done what I knew how to do in flight simulation. So I was looking for something else to do. Uh, one of the, the designer, the producers we had at uh, Microprose loved pirates and said, you know, why don't you do a pirate game? And uh, it was kind of appealing. And we had at that time figured out this technology trick where with the Commodore 64, you could compress a, a, an image, a graphic image into a font and bring it up really quickly. and uh, so I said, you know, a, an adventure game that wasn't about parsing and things like that, but kind of showing you images, almost like flipping the pages of a storybook. And that was kind of the, the model that I was, wanted to use. And we had this new technology that would allow us to do that, bring up these pictures quickly, and, uh, you know, a menuing system, and then, you know, toss in some sword battles and, and sailing and, you know, all sorts of, it was like, um, you we, make we, it sound so easy. We, <laughs> and then you just have one of the most iconic video games of all time. No big deal. <laughs> well, we didn't know what genres were in those days. You know, we didn't have to be first-person shooters or, you know. It was kind of like, well, there should be some sword fighting and there should be some romance and there should be, you know, some sailing. And yeah, sure, what the heck. For sure, what the heck. That was our philosophy. <laughs> well, it worked, actually. It's pretty good, I guess. So, um... 1987 to 1991. It's a four-year stretch there. Um, and in that four-year stretch, you made Pirates, you made Railroad Tycoon, and you made Civilization in four years. So that, uh, for what I found out today, I sort of thought that through, and I thought, you know, that's less than the development cycle of <laughs> XCOM. And so, and then I went and I cried. Um, <laughs> and uh, I had a good long look at myself in the mirror. Um, but... I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? I mean, that, that's a, it was all flight simulators, and then you make those three iconic games, basically, you know, giving birth to the strategy genre. And sorry for the mental analogy there. The, uh, but, but you basically created this, this genre of strategy games with that. And where did that come from? Was it after Pirates? You are like, I want to do more, more strategy games. Well, I think we had kind of established our team by that point. We had artists, we had some great uh, producers and, and, and writers that wrote these awesome manuals to support our games. 
we had really a, a team in place that was uh, load strategy. A number of people came from Avon Hill, a board gaming company. It was really, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd kind of gotten a, uh, you know, a rhythm, a stride going. And so that um, <clears throat> Bruce Shelley um, really encouraged a railroad tycoon. He was a kind of railroad guy. He had actually done 1830, the board game with, uh, with Avalon Hill. So I, I kind of put together a little model railroading simulation because when I was a kid, I loved, I tried to make a model railroad, but it took so long I gave up. So I figured a computer would be a perfect place to, to make a model railroad. Uh, and he saw that and said, well, you know, there's the history of model railroads, and then there's railroads in Europe, and then there's, you know. So I said, okay, Bruce, I'll, you know, put that in. <laughs> uh, so it turned into this. Uh, and this is Bruce Shelley, who went Bruce on to Shelley. be instrumental. He, you know, he worked with you, and then he went on to be instrumental in the Age of Empires. Ensemble, series. yes, yeah. right. same, same Bruce. Um, and Railroad Tycoon kind of struck a nerve with a lot of people um, <clears throat> in the, the kind of the first of the God games that we had done. You know, SimCity was out there, a couple of other things, but. We really found that there was a depth and a richness to these games that, that really resonated with us. And we wanted to, you know, we said, okay, we did railroads. Well, what's a topic bigger than railroads that would be cool to we do, you know, a God game? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what? that's classic designer overscoping, by the way. <laughs> Let's make it bigger and cooler. Uh, and so we decided to do Civilization. And uh, that, was a, that was a magical experience. Although um, we kind of uh, got off on the wrong track, we, we actually made it a kind of a SimCity type game initially where you, you'd zone different areas for, for villages and things like that. And then you kind of sit back and watch it happen. And we realized uh, you know, that wasn't fun. So we actually went away and did covert action, came back uh, and said, wait a minute, how about turn-based? You know, here's a radical concept, a turn-based game where you actually do everything yourself. Um, and that was the magic, I think, that kind of... Uh, so you just popped things. out covert action in between those two? Yeah. That's just like an afterthought? You're just like, man. Yeah, oh, just, to cleanse, just to cleanse the palate, you know. God. <laughs> I love you and I hate you. I hate you. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you talk to people about this, and but did you realize, was it Civ, did you realize in that moment that what you were doing was pretty special? I mean, was there a sense in the company, or did you have a sense as a designer, like, hey, this is actually kind of special, what we're working on here? I think we knew in the team that the, this game was somehow compelling in a way that maybe the other games hadn't been, that it, because we, we couldn't stop playing them, and we couldn't stop coming up with new ideas. I think you, know, you and I had that experience with Civ yep. where we'd get together every week and say, hey, here's five new cool things we could add to the game. And that's really, I think, a sign that a game has, has got this, this incredible potential and is, is kind of grabbing you as a designer. Um, so we, we kind of look forward. I mean, Bruce tells a story where every morning I'd leave a disc on his chair, and he'd kind of boot it up and just to see what was new that day. And, and the game kind of generated its own ideas. So I think we knew uh, early on that, that the, the game was kind of cool, but we had to really convince uh, the company that the, this, was, this had potential because it was very different from anything it was not a flight simulator, so um, so we had to kind of push that through. But you did have to convince people of Civ. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was not. It was, and actually, it went out uh, fairly quietly. And it was only about two or three months later that I got a call from Bill. Uh, he was at some game convention. It was late at night. He was drunk, I think. And he said, <laughs> Everybody's talking about this civilization game. Man. Great, Bill. Okay, I'll talk to you in the morning. I love you, Sid. <laughs> I'm a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> but. I mean, it was his enthusiasm that helped to, to you know, make it a success, but it really took a long time. It's hard to imagine the days before the internet, but you know, you'd send a, a game out there, send a bunch of floppies, and maybe a letter would come back two or three weeks later, hey, I bought this game, it's pretty cool. Here's what I would change, but, <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> Not entirely different, that's fair. Um, so now we move into the portion that's where the difficult, no more softballs for you, Sid. All right, I'm going to ask you the tough questions. <clears throat> All right, so here's a, oh, this one's kind of, this is kind of <laughs> dramatic. I don't really want to start. All right, so are games, as a designer, do you feel that games are important? Do you feel that we are contributing to the, the overall um, uh, uh, greater good of society? Now, you can say no, but it'll be awkward. So... <laughs> Uh, Please support your answer, okay, is what I'm saying here. Well, I'll defer that question to everyone here. What do we think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. Having fun is important. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think 
at least you know you can say that there are a lot of people who you know it's not easy to um, to find a lot of joy sometimes in life, but you know at least with your games you know you're contributing. Do you get a sense of that? I mean, obviously something like this is a great opportunity to meet people who your games have affected. You know, I saw a lot of people come up to you and talk about I've been playing your games since Civ One. Right, right. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. I mean, it's really great. We have a connection even though we've never met. I think when you play a game by a designer, you feel that you kind of understand a little bit. You know, they understand you perhaps a little bit because they've made a game that you like to play. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a connection with people that that I really have never met, but we have something very strong in common when I when I run into gamers. And you know, again, it's surprising how often you know somebody will oh civilization yeah you're the guy oh you know so <laughs> then they're everywhere you you know you walk down the aisle in an airplane you'll see three or they four look people just like us <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> so it's a cool thing it's very yeah. cool um and and this is this experience has been awesome i think it's been magical and very humbling to to meet people who the games have meaning for but back when you were originally making games, like, did you have a sense of community? I mean, did you have a sense of, of feedback? Did you have a way of interacting with people who the games meant something to? Not really. I think we, we always made games for ourselves, basically. I think in a lot of ways we still do that. We make games that we like to play, and hopefully somebody else will enjoy it as well. But there was, not the, there was no internet. There were no opportunities to really uh, get together with with gamers, so we we would have a you know a, a, a GDC with only game designers once a year, where twenty or thirty game designers would get together and talk games. That was really our community was other game designers. We seldom had a chance to interact with with gamers, except for the letters telling me what I had done wrong with with various <laughs> games. But um, I wrote most of those, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> but that's you know things have changed a lot, and we you know having a, an event like this is is really awesome. So. Your personality, I don't know if people un know your personality. You're a very, very kind, very, you know, um, mild-mannered guy. But, like, for you as a designer, you know, you're running these big projects. What for you is a, a perfect day? You know, is it just working on code all day long? I know it doesn't. I know there are no meetings on your perfect day, Sid. <laughs> but is it, is it writing code? Is it solving a problem with other people? I mean, what, what's the perfect day for you as a designer? I really enjoy the, probably the first half of a project is, is the most exciting. I'll, if, if, on a good day, I'll get up in the morning. Um, by the time I get to work, I'll have a list of five or six ideas that I want to, things that I want to put into the game, you know, things that have come into me overnight or whatever, like, uh, you know, the problem that, that I can solve by just changing this line of code or here's a new feature that make the game a lot more fun. Um, so those kind of days where I just have a bunch of stuff to work on, I sit down and, and start coding are, the, are, the, are the really the, the best days. Um, not too many meetings, not too many bug lists. Uh, the second, the second half of the project is still fun, but uh, it's, it's not quite as creative. Uh, it's a lot more uh, cleaning up loose ends and things like that. And you know, we've we've talked about going through the valley of despair when it looks like this game is just not working. It's not. People don't get it. I'm the only person who understands this game. They don't like the interface. <laughs> So you got to power through that, and uh, eventually, so the light shines. You you talk about, and it's true. The Valley of Despair is something that's very real, and you coined that very very dramatic <laughs> phrase. But now we use it all the time, and it's something very real. Every project has that. Um, but one of the things that, and I I do love you. I think you're the greatest guy I've ever met. However, I find one of the things I find irritating about you. Um, <clears throat> Yes, we're at that part of the show, okay? <laughs> I'm going to air grievances now. Um, it's just that you you don't seem to. That I think design can be a very stressful job. I think it can be, um, it, there's a lot of pressure involved nowadays, and there's a fair amount of stress. Um, and so, but you don't seem to exhibit that outwardly. You know, you seem, I, I, I've never seen you raise your voice in 15 years. I've never seen you get angry and maybe you go home and you know you you know you, <laughs> you you know kick the wall or something I don't know but you in in the office you seem very level I mean do you feel the stress do you feel the pressure of, of making games I have the world's best job you know it's hard to feel upset or angry you know, when you have the best job in the world um, I, I think I also have some amount of confidence that whatever the problem is it's going to get solved that we've run into these kind of things before. We have 
uh, this this wealth of experience. You know, if we just apply that to the problem, it's going to get it's going to get resolved. So, uh, yeah, we have tough days. We have things that are frustrating. Um, but to be able to look back on, you know, we had this problem before, and this is how we solved it, or there's going to be a way to fix this, I think, is, is, is helpful for keeping your, your equilibrium. But, um, you know, if you step back and say, I get to make, I get to design computer games, it's hard to, hard to get upset with, uh, with, with that. That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Um, <clears throat> so you've done it, you've done it all, right? You've done big teams, you've done small teams, you've done tiny teams where you've done the art. Um, social games, mobile games, um, you know, what is your favorite team environment to work in? Well, I enjoy the game design part and the programming of the, uh, the, the rules and the AI and things like that. So the more of that that's involved in the project, the happier I am. Um, <clears throat> generally, that'll be a smaller team, although it, it can be in a large team if a, if a lot of the things are delegated. But um, I like probably the smaller team because I get to spend more of my time on the design aspect and maybe less on the uh, on the other parts. And well, I think one of the the hallmarks of of your games is that you don't use violence. There's no cursing, you know. And I think that that's that's something I've always yes, Jake. Yeah, I know, I know. I feel you judging me, Sid, <laughs> and and I agree. I mean, that actually is something that. I think I, I always really liked about working on um, Firaxis games. Something I like working for you is that it was, you know, there there was no violence, there was no cursing. Certain games, obviously, that that's an important part of the experience. That's a great mechanic, but for you, that's never been a mechanic you've used. And is that something that ah, it's just your personality it manifests, or do you ever catch yourself saying, "Nah, that's too much. I don't want to. I don't want to be responsible putting that in the game." I think part of it is my personality. Part of it is is I don't know that it's necessary. Um, another thing is is uh, I have a son who grew up. Uh, he was now twenty four. Basically, was growing up during my career, and you know I, I felt some sort of a responsibility to to do games that, that you know that he could play for starters, um, but also that you know would would uh, uh, would not mess up his mind. Um, you know I think that it's uh, it's kind of funny how far we've gone. And then we tell a story about Railroad Tycoon. There's a, there's a scene where the bridge is washed out and the train is going to go over the, uh, <laughs> over the bridge. And I made sure that the, you could see the engineer and the brakeman jumping out of the <laughs> train before it got to the bridge. I said, nobody's going to die in this game. Um, it's basically an old G.I. Joe cartoon where they all have parachutes. They all have parachutes, yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, there's violence in civilization. You know, there, there, it's not that there's no violence, but I think it's not, it's not glorified. It's not gratuitous. It's part of, part of what the game is, is, is about. And sort of along those lines, I mean, do you feel a responsibility for the games you make? I mean, there's, there's the question of your... Or, or what responsibilities do we have as designers, as, as game developers? What responsibilities do we have for the content that we're sort of creating? That is a deep question, Jake. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not in favor of any sort of uh, censorship. You know, I think we're, we're artists, we're creative, and we should be able to do what we want. On the other hand, it's hard to, on the one hand, say our games are immersive and to grab people and allow them to participate and make them the stars, and then say that there's no there's no uh, impact that it doesn't affect them. Uh, so I think we have to walk that line. You know, I think people know the difference between fantasy and reality. Uh, and gamers are very uh, mature and intelligent people, yes. Uh, however, um, you know, it's part of the climate and whatever we can do to create a, you know, a positive climate, I think we should do. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is the sort of thing where we've seen we, we, for so long, we wanted games to be viewed as important and to be viewed as art or to be viewed as culture. And then when you achieve that, then you can't just turn around and when somebody says, well, you know, you've got this in your game, you can't just wave your arm and say, oh, it's just a game, because it's not anymore. We've decided that we want it to be culture, we want it to be art. So um, I think that is an important part of making games. And I think, you know, I really think we've come a long way. I mean, there was, there was a time when you know, spines were pulled out of uh, players. Uh, <laughs> And we don't have to do that anymore. You know, I think we've, we've, we've got the people's attention. <laughs> we can make good games now, you know. So, so I think there's actually been a lot of progress in that regard. All right, so here is a question that is near and dear to my heart. Game design is not a career with much longevity. 
A rock star today happens to be a bum tomorrow in our industry. <clears throat> so I, I mean, everybody else wanted to know, uh, how can you prevent that from happening? Like, you must have the secret. You've been a successful designer for a very long time. And the fact is, design's very difficult. A cre it's a creative role. A lot of times you're pulling things out of thin air, and a lot of times that doesn't work. And so you see a lot of careers that go up, they go down, they may disappear. Um, so what do you think the secret to your success has been? Well, I was certainly fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. It was a lot easier to be a designer back in the good old days when the industry was a lot smaller, budgets were a lot smaller, the risks were a lot smaller. So I think we were willing to, uh, you know, the pressure wasn't quite as intense as it is, is today. Um, <clears throat> to, I was able to work on a variety of games, I think, and um, I, I mean, a game like Civilization has been around now for close to 25 years. So to, to have that as, as kind of a, a support and, and the community out there uh, really is what has enabled me to keep making games, the fact that people still enjoy playing Civ and uh, the community responds and uh, we're able to find fine young designers to uh, put out additional iterations of the game. Uh, you know, it, without Civ, I don't really know where, where I'd be today. So uh, I have to thank Civilization for keeping me around uh, up to now. Yeah. And these people. And, and these wonderful Civ yeah. players. And, and these wonderful people. Game players. Pander, pander, pander. <laughs> um, and so then along those lines, and it, maybe it goes hand in hand, but game studios close all the time. So I, I've got this list of... Uh, this very short list of other studios founded in 96. So one studio founded in 1996, which is the same year for Axis was founded, uh, is a little studio I like to call Valve. Um, and they're not big yet, but when they, <laughs> they made a game about uh, Steamer, I don't know, but they, when, they, when they hit, they're going to be huge. But Valve was 1996, Lionhead was 1996, and so that was founded by a contemporary of yours. That was founded by Peter Molyneux. And he's no longer there, but the studio is still still working. And then at the same time, on the other side of the coin, Ion Storm was founded in 1996. So um, what is the secret to our longevity? I mean, I, I think that the answer you gave before holds pretty true. I mean, Civ is the engine that really sort of drives us and that we, we owe a lot to. Um, is that what you need as a studio? Is you need a, a, a title that, that, that's that strong, that, that that's that iconic? I think every studio that's lasted a long time has had a, uh, a strong title, but not every studio with a strong title has lasted a long time. I think we've done, uh, we've focused really on listening to Civ players and uh, trying to think about, you know, with the next iteration of Civ, what are we going to do to make it fresh and new, uh, but also uh, have those core qualities that, that, that appeal to Civ players. You know, we have the the one third, one third, one third rule, where it's you know one third is the traditional gameplay, one third is improved from the last version, and one third is brand new. So, and we're now at the point where for every new feature we put in, we have to take something old out yeah. because uh, it's very easy to overwhelm the player with complexity or detail and things like that. So I think we you know we we um, we understand what makes Civ work. We value the input uh, from our players. And we, we kind of put that all together when we bring out a new Civ game. It has some new features, but it's still that kind of recognizable, you know, one more turn gameplay and uh, that, that same feeling of Civ that, that players are responding to. So you know, I think we've been fortunate to have some, some strong titles. But we've also done a pretty good job of, of maintaining those, allowing them to grow in a, in a, in a rational way where uh, the community of people are still playing the game even though they might have started playing it 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Perhaps. So, in a nutshell, what is it like? What are the qualities you need if somebody looks at you and says, "I want to do what Sid does"? Like, what qualities would you look at in in someone to be like a successful designer? What do you have to do as a designer to be successful? I think you have to be a gamer first and foremost. You have to love games. You have to enjoy playing games, and then you have to kind of analyze that love and enjoyment and, and understand what is it that makes this game work. I spend, um, I think of it as, as sitting in all the chairs. Like I'll sit in the designer chair and say, here's a cool new idea. Then I'll sit in the programmer chair and program that in. And then I'll sit in the game player chair and play that idea and say, no, it's not. It's not a very good idea. Take it out. <laughs> I'll go back to the programmer chair and take it out. Um, but being able to really circulate around and, and, and think like the player thinks and, and kind of get into the player's mind and say, am I having fun right now? 
this is a cool part, uh, there should be more of this, this is boring, take it out. Um, <clears throat> as a designer, you can't really have a lot of ego. You had an idea you thought was great, you put it in, it's no fun, you gotta be willing to take it out. Um, so really being a gamer at heart and, and loving the game that you're working on, making, you know, selfish to say it, but making the game for yourself. You're really the only person who's there day after day kind of evaluating what's happening. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't design a game for, uh, you know, a, a five-year-old. I really have to design games primarily for myself because I have to evaluate that game daily. And, and that skill, I think, of being able to come up with ideas but also evaluate them and, and decide whether they, uh, they stay or go is, I think, fundamental to being a game designer. I mean, that's something that I think is one of the things that I... I you and know. being will, willing to listen to other people. You know, I think that, that uh, again... Did you sorry, say that when I was talking? <laughs> yeah. Did you seriously do that you know, while I was talking? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of, one of the things that always struck me about you is that you, you said no ego, and that's very true. For someone in your position, it'd be very easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm Sid Meier. But what I always saw with you was that we would have meetings and we'd say, hey, it doesn't matter who said it, someone would be, we'd play one of your prototypes and we'd be like, Oh, this isn't fun. I don't like this. And you didn't have, you never had this sort of like response. Yes, it is. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. You're having fun. You don't, you don't know it, but you are That's, having fun. That was the response. And we said, yes, Sid. Yes, my liege. It is very fun. Um, but you, you never had a response other than saying like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll go fix that. It didn't matter who said it to you. And that always struck me. That always struck me because on your behalf, many times I'd hear people say to you, I don't like this. And I'd like, I'd like, on your behalf, I'd be like, oh my God, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then your response would be, okay, I'll fix that. And you just never had any sort of ego about that. And I think that, I think when you say having no ego, that's what I've certainly seen in you. Um, and why don't you ever say I'm Sid Meier, you know? Why don't you? That doesn't work. Um... Yeah. <laughs> Have you tried? You don't know, I mean. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, like I say, being able to listen, I think, is also important as a designer. I mean, if, if somebody's not having fun, you can't argue, you know, I tried to argue with you, but you can't argue with that. You might argue with their solution. You know, you might say, well, uh, okay, that's interesting, but here's another way maybe to solve your problem. The problem is real, yeah. but it's really my job, the designer's job, to solve that problem. So I'm very receptive to what is it that's not working for you about this game, and, and we're going to go fix that. So, um, you know, you, you're, the more people that you're kind of bringing into that circle of, of, of ideas, the more good ideas you're going you're gonna to get. So it's, listening is just, you know, I think good, good game design practice. Yeah. So what about people who are starting out or people who are looking at this as a career, whether it's design or whether it's programming, whether it's art, if somebody says, I want to make games, you know, what is your advice to them? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over. Those um, glory days are no, gone. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. It's, it's a ton of, you know, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful job. And there's actually more and more opportunities for making games when you look at, you know, um, iOS and the iTunes Store and different places like that where there's, there's just tons of games out there. But it's a very different, um, uh, it's a very different industry these days. So I think there's many opportunities for being a coming designer, but, um, to create a legacy is, is, I think, is going to be very difficult these days because uh, there are hits and there, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very dynamic industry and um, just a different, I think it's a different type of career these days. There's, there's uh, probably a lot more game designers out there because of all the designer uh, gaming opportunities that there are, but um, the, the chance to have a kind of a, a career uh, the way that, you know, that, that uh, was possible before is, it's probably different. I think, I think you know, time will tell. But uh, the, in terms of getting into the industry, um, certainly that's a question that I get a lot. And there's, um, <clears throat> if you can program and design, you know, make a game. There's, there's a lot of outlets. Put it on the web. Put it in the, in the iTunes store or something. Um, if you're not uh, a programmer, designer, um, get involved with a, with a uh, gaming company, depending what your skill is, if you're a programmer or a... Um, an artist, or if you just if you want to do uh, QA testing or whatever, um, <clears throat> certainly in our company there's plenty of opportunities to kind of contribute your design ideas to the process. And if you've got great ideas, uh, you might become a game designer. Yeah, and there's now there's this vibrant indie scene where, and there are great tools out there for people. Whether it's Unity, there's all these great tools for people to actually make games. And so I think your advice to 
go and make a game is, is probably more relatable now than ever because there are a lot of great tools for people to make games. But that's pretty much the key, right, is actually make a game first. and Make a couple of failures. Yeah. I really, I think that's the key. I mean, I've got a disc full of prototypes that never mm -hmm. made the production stage. You know, not every idea is going to be uh, good, but you're going to learn from your probably more from your failures than your successes. So be ready to fail, be ready to try something new, and just keep on making games. And this is true. Sid has many, many, many prototypes. So sometimes we'll be talking about something, and he'll be like, I made that prototype. <laughs> and he'll pull that out, and you'll be like, wow, that's, yep, that's it. That's the game. So, I mean, I think that failure is a very important part of what we do. I mean, that's you're not going to be successful right off the bat. And, and, and I don't mean over a career. I mean, I think just making a game, the key is to find those failures, find them early, don't feel bad about them, sort of work through them, right? I mean, you would, you would say that failure is a pretty big part of what we do, right? Yes. We fail every day. Yep, we, we do. We get back up again. Keep going. Is it, is it harder now to make games? So this kind of alludes to what you're talking about. I mean, do you feel like it's harder to make games, or is design harder than it was 25, 30 years ago? I think it's easier to make games these days with the tools that are available out there or the tools certainly we have at Firaxis. We can put something together very quickly. Um, it's hard to make a game that stands out, I think. I mean, a lot of the genres have been explored and you know, just about every game, if you have a great game idea, you Google it and there are three of them already out there. Um, so I think it's, it's very easy to make games, but to make something that's fresh and that stands out um, is, is, is harder these days. Well, then what was... In your memory, like what was the hardest game you worked on? Like what was the the just the the, the toughest experience for you as a designer? Uh, I think uh, probably the dinosaur game. I've talked about that a little bit, but I wanted to make a dinosaur game, and uh, I thought uh, first it was a kind of a uh, civilization style world of dinosaurs, and that was kind of boring because it didn't have enough dinosaur action. Um, and then say, well, okay, I'm going to turn it into an RTS, you know, real-time strategy game with your kind of a M age of empires with dinosaurs. And um, once I put that prototype together, and there are no ranged dinosaurs, you know. There's, 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 I was I was inventing venom spitting dinosaurs, and you know, I was just missing that ranged combat. So we just would all, you know, cluster together, and <laughs> chew on each other. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Sounds like a good time. <laughs> okay, no, that's not working. So I'm going to do a, a card game, a dinosaur card game, you know? I like oh, magic. that's right. I forgot the dinosaur yeah. card game. It eventually morphed into a card game. Kind of like Magic the Gathering. You'd place your lands, and out would come your dinosaurs, and you could put some extra claws on them or your, some extra energy, warm blood. Ooh, exciting. Um, and that was fun, but I realized that it just kind of remade Magic the Gathering, so it had already been done, so it was... Had to put that away. And they're very litigious. <laughs> so either way, that probably wasn't going to work. Um, and then, so do you have a game where you you think back at on uh, think back on it maybe the most fondly? I mean, is there an experience making a game that you just really always sort of stands out to you? I have pretty positive uh, memories of most of my games. I, I I almost think of them as children. Your children have their own personalities. Like you know, there's a smart kid and the funny one, and the one that didn't quite live up to his potential. <laughs> <laughs> and they're each, I'm fond of them all, you know. I'm really fond of each game, and I, I, I have good memories of the production process. But some of them went smoothly, some of them, some of them not so much. Some of them did, as, you know, did better than I thought. Some of them did worse than I thought. Um, but I, there's, um, they were each uh, great. They're, they're all great kids, you know, and uh, I, you know, I love them all. Oh, um, they love you too. So <laughs> speaking of your kids, I mean, you, you have spawned a lot of other designers as well. So you have a lot of protégés out there in the world. And so when you play the games of people who worked pretty closely with you, so Age of Empires or Rise of Nations, um, Brian Reynolds, um, Rise of Nations, XCOM, like when you play those games... Pardon me? <laughs> XCOM, it's about a name. Never mind. Oh. It's... <clears throat> I, I've worked with you for 15 years, so. Um, Sorry. So um, when you play those games, do you see, like, hey, I, you know, do you see something you're like, oh, I taught that guy that? <laughs> I mean, or, or do you 
do you get a sense that like this is your design philosophy, but now you've seen it change a little bit? Uh, I admire what they've brought to it. You know, the Age of Empires or Rise of Nation. I, you know, I think those are really brilliant uh, games. So I'm, I feel like it's an extension. Like, oh, I wish I, you know, I wish I designed that game, but I'm glad that game is out there so I can play it without having to go through all the trouble of actually making it myself. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I love to see uh, those kind of games uh, go out there, and and you know, it's been wonderful. You know, with with Bruce and Brian and other people to see them uh, kind of carry the flag for, for strategy and, and see that success. And, and I think it strengthens all of us. When there are great strategy games out there, um, the audience, you know, the, the, the people are playing and they're, they're looking for maybe our next game next. So it's really not a, a competitive situation. It's more that we're trying to really build this, um, this audience, build this, uh, this, this hunger for strategy gaming, and we all kind of help each other in that regard. So, you got a lot of career left. You're still a young man, um, but do you care about your legacy? I mean, do you care about what you, your your impact on the industry or your legacy? And, and if you do, I mean, do you know what you want that to be? I think um, you know it really comes home at an event like this, where you see a father and a son, or a mother and a, a daughter, who have uh, you know the, the the parent has passed on their enjoyment of of, of gaming of a strategy to to their child and you know th there's a bonding there you know that I've experienced with my son when we play a game together and, you know the opportunity to, cr to create those situations and those opportunities is really uh, is really exciting you know to, to have people talk about uh, you know what their the, the amount of time and enjoyment hopefully they've spent with with games is is, is great um, you know on the other hand I actually there's a Sid Meier who I kind of separate myself you know, today I'm Sid Meier, but tomorrow I'm going to go back to work, or maybe the day after. And um, <laughs> no, he's going to go back tomorrow. I'm telling you. I, 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 you know, when I think if you start talking about legacy or something, you're you're kind of done. Uh, and I still have a lot of games I still want to write. So um, I'm I'm very proud of the games that 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 I've done. But I uh, I still enjoy making games, and I want to want to make some more. But you know, what like a day like today, it really comes home what we have accomplished and, and, and that there is value in games and that people are willing to travel thousands of miles, you know, to, to see the next thing that we're doing and to kind of uh, just uh, spend a little time with us is, is, is incredibly gratifying. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with, with that. But I'm, you know, I think that's, that's wonderful. That's a pretty but good I, legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Not that you have one. You don't have one yet. <laughs> um, sorry. So we're gonna we're done with the serious questions. So now I'm gonna ask you a couple of uh, lighthearted questions, which is um, okay. If you had to make a racing game, a first-person shooter, a fighting game, or a point-and-click story adventure, no strategy. Don't bring strategy into this. Uh, which one would you do? Well, I I kind of like to do them all actually. Um, I I. I actually spent a lot of time playing racing games back in the day, and uh, I really enjoyed kind of the putting together different parts and seeing how that would how that would feel and, and drive. And I think kind of a Lego-ish type racing game would be a lot of fun, where there's a lot of putting together different parts and wheels and engines and tires and then taking it out on the track and having a variety of tracks. So you'd have to kind of customize your race car to the to the track. That'd be my racing game. What was the other? What was you the you one? just picked racing game, I guess. No, then, what, yeah. what was the other one? Uh, was first person shooter. Let's see you do this one, buddy. <laughs> uh, actually, Jake, um, my son is creating a game for the Baltimore Museum of Industry, um, and uh, it, it's a first person, well, side shooter. But the um, the protagonist is the security guard in the museum, and he carries a flashlight. So <laughs> I like it. Okay. He shines a light on the exhibits that try to come to life at night. So that's my version of a shooter. All right, that's good. Yeah, you're stealing from your son, Sid. <laughs> just so you know. Um, we collaborated. What was the other? A point and click story adventure. Well, I think Pirates was my yeah, game, okay. adventure game. That's fair. Done that. Fair, right, fair, <laughs> fair. What else? Have? Oh, a fighting game. Fighting game. No, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, if you weren't a game designer, but you were a tree, no. If you weren't a game designer, what other career would you have liked to pursue? Well, if I didn't need to make any money, 
I would like to be a musician. I enjoy, that's really my, one of my main hobbies. Um, I can't imagine what I could, could possibly do for a living. <laughs> my programming skills are laughed at by the current generation of programmers. <laughs> um, my art skills have been proven inadequate. Um, I don't know. I don't know. All don't, right, musician. <laughs> we'll go with musician. You could be a musician. Right, yeah, right. yeah. This is just Starving a fantasy musicians. question. So, yeah, you could say anything you want. All right, and so uh, last question for you. This is a weird last question, but uh, cars, clothes, exotic vacations, giant mansions. Sid, <laughs> do you live large? Where's that swagger? I want to know, <laughs> Sid, how, like, what's your guilty pleasure? Excess. Um, I have, I developed these weaknesses. Um, for a while, it was golf. I was convinced that that next club was going to allow me to turn the corner and actually become a golfer. Uh, so I gave up on that. Then it was guitars. You know, there's always that next guitar that's going to make you sound even better. Uh, <clears throat> no. Uh, so I gave up on that. And now it's radio-controlled airplanes. Uh, you know, I know I'm not going to crash this next one. So. <laughs> So I do have, I do, you know, the internet is such a wonderful thing. You press a button and a day later something shows up at your door stuff. <laughs> I mean, so I do, I do go a little overboard in my hobbies, but they're healthy. They're healthy hobbies. They sound healthy. <laughs> All right. Well, Sid, thank you for taking this time with us tonight. And, um, and uh, thanks. Thank we'll you, do Jake. this again sometime. All right? right. Thank you, Jake. All right. <laughs>